I invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 12. John 12, we'll pick up in verse 23 in a few moments. John chapter 12, we'll pick up in 23 in a minute. As we continue to, to look at our identity in Christ, who am I? Well, probably the, the single greatest title that you could be given is to be a servant of God. I am a servant of God. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Servant. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said over and over and over again. Jesus himself, he said, I didn't come to be served, but to? Well, I love it when y'all know the passages. Amen. I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Paul, the apostle, he would start every letter with Paul, an apostle, or a bondservant, a slave, a doulos. Everybody tries to call it bondservant, but look, it's slave in the Greek. Okay? A slave to Jesus Christ a complete and total follower. There is, there is no greater title, there's no greater position in the kingdom of heaven than being a servant of the living God. Now, I think the church today in general, we've, we've lost our understanding of what it means to be a servant of God. Way too often, we believe that we are the ones that are in charge. We think this old world and everything about it is about our joy and our happiness for our pleasure. Well, at least that's the way we live. But the reality is, is when Jesus came, he redefined, he, he turned the, the paradigm on its head. The servant is the greatest. The servant is the greatest. Just as it was demonstrated by Jesus himself, Tom Rainer says that we join our churches expecting others to serve us, to feed us, and to care for us. We don't like the hypocrites in the church, but we fail to see our own hypocrisies. And where does that come from? When we expect everybody else to do it. Oh, such and such will do it. Oh, such and such will get it done. We don't realize that it is our responsibility as children of God, as followers of Christ, to serve. Now we have people that come in from the outside that, that, that aren't believers. They don't know any better. And yes, we get stuck serving them and taking care of them and doing everything in the world. But that's our role. That's our position before Christ. We are servants of God because that is how Christ lived and we're supposed to be as Christ. Verse 26 John 12, 26. I'm just going to read this for you, and then we're going to back up a little bit. It says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there, may I, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Serves him. Follows in the footsteps of Christ. We have to be just like him. We're going to come back to that verse in a second because I honestly believe the, one of the big stumbling black blah, 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 stumbling blocks. One of the big stumbling blocks for Christians today is lordship. Lordship is one of those most over uh, uh, misunderstood and seen at things. So I'm just going to quote a verse for you. If you've got your spot and you've got your Bible, you're welcome to get there. But I just want you to write down Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or from our old timers who know that King James, mammon which is money, okay? I am a servant of God, and I have only one master, and I have to have a single-minded devotion to him and him alone. Too many of us, too many of us are really good at saying, I don't know God, or wait a minute, we don't even consult God before we make a decision on things in life. There is only one response that is justifiable, and that's yes. Wait. There is only one response, and that is yes, Lord. 
If you, when God calls you to share the gospel with your neighbor, when God tells you to go clean up after somebody, when God instructs you to do some random act of service, say, so if your answer is no, then he's not Lord. If your answer is no, then he's not Lord. You do understand Lord means total and complete control and power. And when he gives a command and an instruction, we are to follow through with it. Not go, well, it doesn't fit my schedule this week. And well, that's kind of convenient. That could be expensive. Just go on one mission trip and you'll find out it's inconvenient. It's expensive. But boy, is it effective for the kingdom. I'll tell you something. I promise you, if you don't have the money to go on a mission trip, I bet you if God's telling you to go, the money will show up. Hey, there's some folks getting ready to go to the Valley Mission, and they're shorthanded. Just saying. Have you just been saying no to the people that are going when God has been telling you you should be on something like that? Just leaving it there for you. Just leaving it there for you. The real question is, though, to decide in, in, in our own lives, when we figure out who's the Lord of our lives, the real question is, is when push, come to sho when push comes to shove, which Lord in our lives wins? Either me or he. Which one wins? Well, we all both, however, one of us say that God should win every single time. So if, if, if he is Lord, you can't say no. We can't say no because I am a servant of God and I know that I must say yes, Lord. And now I've already enlisted someone with a much more beautiful voice than I have to sing, a, I guess it's a bridge or a chorus to a song. To remind you, every time God speaks into your ear or whispers something to you, the way we should respond. This is your cue, buddy. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Did you see? Well, maybe not this day, Lord, but yes, Lord. Just yes. It's not like that silly movie that that guy, that comedian made that says yes, man. I'm talking about God. He's not going to lead you to anything that's dumb, foolish, as far as, well, it might be foolish to the world. But he is going to lead you to do the things that bring him the most honor and the most glory. While you may not see the results right now, I guarantee you God sees the results. I tell you, there's, I guarantee you there's some kids that shows up at Beach Club from time to time, that they hear the gospel. By the way, that's at a public school. Shh. <laughs> There's some that go one time, maybe twice, and they don't ever go again. They heard the gospel. You don't think God can do something with that later? God does things in so many ways. And somebody had to say, yes, I will go and serve. Yes, I will go and do. Loud and whiny youngins at the end of the day are hard to deal with at times. Wow. I, man, I, I thought I figured I'd get a few more amens on that one, but you know, it's okay. But it's tough. So now that I've done the, the, the preamble to my sermon this morning, my introduction, because that, that point one was for free. Okay, now we'll get into the passage, okay? It really gets to, I am a servant of God. And I have to say yes, because I'm totally and completely devoted to him. The second thing we need to see is, is that we've got to look into our motivation and the life we live. Second thing is, is I am a servant of God, and I live to serve him. I am a servant of God, and I live to serve him. Can you just say that I am a servant of him, of God? Sorry. I am a servant of God. I am a servant of God, and I live to serve him. And I live to serve him. It's very simple, isn't it? I know that's not complicated, but that's what the scriptures point to. Everything about it is. We have to look at our motivation sometimes. Pick back up, and we're in John 12, 23. It says, and Jesus answered them. And now he had some, he had some Greek, Greek proselytes that were coming up to talk to him, what have you. And um, 
they wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus didn't really totally answer them, but he was answering something else, and it's important for all of us and the disciples to have heard. It says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What is his motivation here? Sometimes we think that, boy, it's, it's all about our benefit. You know, man, we live in a service economy. Is that fair to say? Is it a service economy? You pay somebody to wait on your table to bring your food. You pay somebody to cook. A lot of you pay somebody to cut your grass. We, we pay someone, and we expect to get a benefit for it. And the purpose of us serving others is so that we can make enough money to pay somebody else to serve us, right? You thought about that, right? Well, see, but, but, but serving God doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it, it, it's not about quick pro quo. It's not about, hey, I served you, now you better come serve me. Well, what'd they ever do for me? No. It's about bringing honor and glory to the Father. See, Jesus says the hour is coming in which, in which the Son of Man come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, in the background to that passage, just a little bit, and I'll just give you this for fun. In John 8, 54, Jesus explains that, that his glorification is not tied to his self glorification, but to pleasing the Father. And I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of it. It says, if I glorify myself, I glor my glory is in nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. Now, we're just, we're, we know that Jesus is, is completely worthy and deserving of all glory and honor that we give him because the Father said so. But Jesus' mentality as a servant his motivation to do what he was doing was to honor the Father, to bring glory and honor to the Father. And that should be one of our questions. It should be, is what I'm doing today in the way I'm serving, does it bring honor to God? Not that person's not going to show any gratitude. They're not going to be thankful. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Groundhog Day. Have you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Oh, come on. Bill Murray is hilarious in that movie. Okay, he's goofy, but you ever, you know the part where he keeps every day and he goes and runs and catches the kid. Oh, come on. Anyway, he goes and he runs and catches the kid. He, he relives the day every, over and over again. And there's this part where he runs and he catches this kid to try to keep him from breaking his arm over and over and over again. And the kid never says, thank you. You know, serving God, serving people in the name of God, is never about hearing them look at us and say, thank you. It's not necessarily about them ever setting foot back in our church. It's about bringing honor to God. When we serve others by serving God, it's about his glory. When we follow through and we love our neighbor as ourselves, it's about bringing him glory, him credit. It's not about self-fulfilling ourselves. And Jesus set this example when he said when he's going to be glorified, he was pointing to the Father. 24, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to live to life eternal. You see, we live to serve God. We live to serve him. But a lot of time, what gets in the way what gets in the way is our loyalty to this old world. Our devotion to to a world and a lifestyle that we have supposedly put in our past. Paul describes what we should do when we receive Christ better than anyone in Galatians 2.20 when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is so no longer 
I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The idea of the single piece of grain of wheat falling in the earth, it dies, but then it grows up. And have you ever seen a single single shaft of grain? There's multiple grains and it produces more. Then you take those grains and you plant them again and they die again. Whole, whole, whole picture of death, burial, and resurrection, okay? It dies again and they produce more fruit and they produce more. The idea is putting our lives and selves to death. The old person, now Christ obviously did not have to die for his own sins. He died for ours. And by the fact that he died and his blood was shed, he was able to bear much fruit because he brought eternal salvation. But one of the big problems we have in service is, is we just love our comforts. We love our, our preferences. We love our life to go the way we want it to go. We like easy. We don't want to be hassled. We don't want to be taken advantage of. But you see, he says, we need to have a life that's beyond this world. We need to start thinking of the eternal perspective, which is life in God, life in service to God himself. In 26, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. He must follow me. That means we must put to death sin and self in our lives. We must allow God to destroy the old man that is within us. And we must, sir, we, we must accept the new life that he's given. You know that picture of baptism, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of his life, the newness of his resurrection, that is the picture and the idea that is going on here. I love that Galatians passage when Paul, he's sitting there going, but the life that I live now, I live by faith. I am a servant of God. I bear fruit. I bear the fruit of service and sacrifice for others. You know, Jesus demonstrated this idea in John 13, 12. And you're welcome to turn over there if you would like. I'll give you time. You know, what do we think of controversial things nowadays within the church? Well, I won't go all the way into them, but controversies that have happened in the lives of churches. Carpet, screens, style of music. One of the earliest controversies in Baptist life was foot washing, at least in America for sure. Foot washing. You know, foot washing. All right, just 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 because I need to know. Anybody ever had been been to a foot washing service other than me? Not very many of you, but a few of you. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I've only been to one. I've only been to one. And you know something? It was done after the regular church service, and it was under strict rules of men and men. Women and women, and, and the only husbands and wives were okay, but that was it. We still had a fight on our hands after that. I'm serious. I, I mean, it, it's tough. So when I talk about foot washing, no, I'm not asking us to institute it right after church, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you that now. But I want you to realize and see that there is a struggle. There is a struggle to this day with the flesh. There is a struggle with what it means to serve the living God. And in verse 12 it says, so when he washed their feet, and this is talking about Jesus washing their feet at the Lord's Supper, it says, and taking his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I do. Now, if you really want to know the argument, it's over example. Does he mean that we're supposed to practice foot washing or it's the example of lowly service? I'm okay either way. I'm okay either way. But the ideal that the one who was going to the cross, the one who had never sinned, he took up the lowliest, the lowest ranked position in the household. See, we, we often forget, we don't think much about washing feet because we wear shoes and socks. But imagine a time in which everybody walked wherever they were going to go and they wore sandals. And they weren't these beautiful paved sidewalks and, and asphalt streets that we have. They were dirty and they were muddy and animals just went where animals went. Let it sink in. Okay, it's pretty nasty. And the lowliest servant in rank, their responsibility was when every guest come in was to wash each one's feet. Our Lord and Savior knelt and washed the feet of the disciples so that we would know that we are not those who are to be served. We are the ones who are to do the serving. It is our responsibility as followers of Christ to humble ourselves to the lowliest point in society to serve others. You know, when we humble ourselves, it means we have to sacrifice pride. We have to sacrifice our position. We, 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 boy, it's just not popular. You know, the Bible says if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up. Jesus taught his disciples that they should do as he had demonstrated. He had given this example to them of, of selfless service. I am a servant of God. I bear fruit. I bear the fruit of service and sacrifice. Selfless service. There is no task so little, so dirty, so disgusting, so not important that I am I'm too big to do. Sometimes our dignity and position in life keeps us from wanting to do those things. Jesus could care less about our dignity and our position in life. He called us to serve. Remember point one? If you can tell him no then he's not Lord. Our only response to our Lord, especially in service and everything else, is yes, Lord. Verse 16, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one, is one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you... Somebody see that right there? You are blessed if you... So it's one thing to know them. It's one thing to know them. Hey, I can quote all these scriptures. I can quote the Lord's Prayer. I can name the books in the Bible backwards. In fact, I've committed to memory the entire Sermon on the Mount. Knowledge is a great and wonderful thing. It makes for good parlor tricks. But what really matters is that what we know of God, that we practice. One of the biggest problems in the church today is we join churches thinking that we are to be served, cared for, fed. And yet, we say we know the scriptures over and over, but we prove ourselves hypocrites when we don't act on what they say. God has called us to be his servants. He placed us here to serve, to care for others, to pray for others, to learn, to teach, to give, and in some cases to die for the sake of the gospel. It's 
Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you want to follow him, if you want to serve him, it means you followed him in putting to death your old life and saying yes to service in the name of Jesus. For those who are sitting here this morning, and you're saying, what's the big deal about loving the world and, and the other side of, of hating the world? I love this old world, and may, maybe, maybe some of this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. This, this whole crucifying of self is a little confusing to you this morning. You know something? We're going to have a time of response in a few minutes. And I want you to know, if that is your situation, I've got a couple of people that would love to meet with you and show you you from God's Word what you need to know to be saved so that you may have understanding of what it means to be crucified with Christ. If you're sitting here this morning, though, And I think this is probably the majority of folks. And you've been telling God no. He keeps saying, you need to do this. You need to serve me here. You need to go over here and serve this person. You need to go over here and do that. And you keep using the word no. Then today is the day you need to repent, confess your sins to God, and rededicate your life to him. Because if he's Lord... There is no no in the equations. It is only yes, Lord. It is only yes, 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 Lord. This morning I stand before a group of people who should be able to look right back at me and say, yes, I am a servant of the living God and I will live a life of service unto him no matter what the cost, no matter what the difficulty no matter what the call. This is our time to respond to him. Let us pray. Father God, you are great, you are wonderful, you are mighty. You in every way have taken care of us and loved us and provided for this very opportunity. This opportunity to serve you. Father, there's probably a couple of people in this room that they're probably a little wore out because they've been carrying the load for so many other people in this church body, in this church family. And we're so thankful for their faithful service. And Father, we ask that you would just continue to undergird and strengthen their devotion to serving you no matter what the time costs, no matter what the financial costs, no matter what the physical costs. And Father, we pray for those in this room right now who have been saying no to serving you, who have been saying no to carrying the load that you have called them to. And Father, we also pray for the one or the few that are in this room that do not know you as their Lord and Savior. Oh, Father, give them the strength to say yes to that that voice that is calling them to know you. Oh, Father, don't let them leave here without knowing you. This is your time of invitation. This is your time of response. Let your spirit fill us and take complete control. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and respond to God's word? For all that you've done, I will thank.